So what would it look like if an attacker could somehow exploit this vulnerability? Well, it would look something like this. Here we have a demo video from the uh, ZekOp researchers, and we're going to explain all this to you later, but basically it just looks like magic. They just run some Python script and there's leaks of information. So this is information disclosure vulnerabilities, somehow getting information about addresses and kernel space that they want to target. Then they write some sort of shellcode cleared NX bit. Oh man, that means they must be defeating, you know, non-executable memory. Okay, over here, you know, now who am I? Well, I am system, I am authority, the empty authority system. And so the attacker has successfully on, taken over control of this VM right here, a vulnerable VM. So now we need to explain like what all goes into this behind the scenes. Like what does it take to make something like this possible? So what were the tricks behind the magic show? Well, to understand that, we're going to have to dig deep into the data structures in play here. So first of all, we're gonna look at this work item PSBH request P net raw buffer, which we said was the attack control data coming in over the network. And it has a particular data structure like so. We've got 16 bytes of compressed header right up here. Then we've got the uncompressed data, which should notionally be compress header dot offset or length. So offset or length right here in the header should specify the size of uncompressed data, followed by the compressed data. The size of this data is the total size of the message that comes in over the network, minus this part right here, the offset or length, which is the uncompressed data, minus the size of the header. So that's why you saw in the you know, call to SMB decompression or compression decompress, uh, you saw sort of a weird calculation for the size. It said, you know, work item PSBH request DW message size minus compress header dot offset minus 16. Well, this is why basically, you know, the programmers knew that the overall structure was like this. And so they said, well, this data is this size, which is the total size minus that minus that. And of course, also remember that we were looking at pseudocode, so the original source code probably had something like size of compressed header in it rather than a hard-coded 16. Okay, so there was that servernet allocate buffer, which was subject to the integer overflow, right? And under normal circumstances, when not dealing with malicious attacker-controlled values, of course, they're always dealing with malicious attacker-controlled values, but under, let's say, optimistic circumstances where, you know, someone's not being mean, then this is what things should look like. You should have an allocation that allocates enough space for the uncompressed data. So it's literally just going to copy the uncompressed data over to the new allocation. And then it should allocate enough size for the decompressed data according to original compressed seg size. So basically, you know, the thing is sending along, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going to need this much size for my decompressed data. And again, like it doesn't say how big the compressed data size is, that's why I just did the subtraction math to figure that out, but it does need to send along how big of a size it needs once this data is going to be decompressed. So under normal circumstances, that's all good. This is copied to there, this is decompressed to there, and it's all peachy keen. But when we have the malicious path of attackers purposefully causing an integer overflow to cause an under allocation, then instead what we're going to see is something like this, where a small amount of size is going to be allocated and it's going to under allocate for the total amount of size it actually needed to decompress that data. And of course, an under allocation can lead to an overcopy. Boom, now you're going outside of the bounds. So what got smashed, right? That is the all important information about how to make this overflow exploitable. So we have to dig deeper into what's going on in this servernet allocate buffer because it's not just a plain Jane malloc equivalent. It's got some uh, setting up of structures because it's basically a special allocation that assumes something about the data structure that it's allocating for and you know initializing things accordingly. So if we drill down into that, that server net allocate buffer, then we will see something like this. Oh, look at that animation. That was great. That was unnecessary. That was kind of the wrong sort of animation, but whatever. Okay, so inside of server net allocate buffer, you had that injure overflowing thing. And so this could overflow from being a big value to being a small value. And let's see sort of, you know, how various small values are handled. 
Okay, so inside here it says, you know, if uh, disable net uh, buffer lookaside list or allocation size is greater than hex 100, 100, then if alloc size is greater than hex 1100, then it's going to turn null. So, okay, alloc size greater than hex 1100, not a path that they want to take. So we need to avoid that path and we want to, you know, try to hit this path, for instance. I will say that there is, you know, this other path that has to do with things like lookaside lists, which is like a caching mechanism. We're not going to care about that. We're going to say that the attacker wants to go to this control flow. So therefore, if the integer overflow this thing, they need to be greater than hex 100, 100, but less than hex 1100. Okay, so then they go into server net allocate buffer from pool. And that alloc size now is, you know, again, somewhere between hex 100, 100 and hex 1100. That is passed in two, the same value is passed in two variables, but uh, two parameters. But ultimately, according to the decompilation that the researchers have uh, reverse engineered, the first argument is not actually used, and just this second argument is what we actually care about. So we see the tainting going on here. We see a whole bunch of acid math going on. So some size calculation for the size of header and buff. So this is just to say that, like, again, this is not a plain malloc and allocation. This is a special purpose, you know, fill in a whole bunch of stuff sort of allocation. Okay, so the attacker controlled alloc size is passed in two parameters, but according to the reverse engineering, it looks like this first one is not actually used. So we have this size. We see the size tainting all sorts of stuff. Size taints that, size taints that, this taints that this taints that, that taints that, plus that, etc. It's all sorts of, you know, tainted data and ultimately a allocation down here using all of this mathed up thing. So again, all sorts of options for integer overflows at any given location that they want. But, you know, we'll see how exactly this is useful later on. So right here, this size of header and buff, it's doing size plus E8. So it turns out that E8 is going to be the size of a server net buffer header. So it basically wants to make sure that it's got whatever you asked for plus some extra size for a server net buffer header, which is going to go at the beginning of this buffer. And then it's allocating size for things like MDLs that we'll talk about in a second. So this E8 would have been the original source code before, you know, this is just decompiled reverse engineered stuff. It would have been, you know, the size of server net buffer header. And then ultimately that is going to be used down here when there is an align up of, you know, this allocated p non paid pooled addresses, uh, size plus 50 and blah, blah, blah. It's ultimately going to be put into this SRB header. So ultimately just, you know, looking at this code, roughly speaking, here is what we're going to get for an allocation. It's going to be 50 bytes that are, you know, added to this thing, and we don't know exactly what they're used for. There's going to be some size assumed for the compressed header offset or length, and the original compressed segment size, right? Those both went into the calculation of this, so they assume, you know, those two things added together equals alloc size. It's going to be a little padding, and there's going to be space for a server net buffer header. So when we look at the server net buffer header in uh, for instance, you know, both the reverse engineered version of it or, uh, you know, it's available in uh, open source reverse engineered things like Doxygen OS, which is kind of a reverse engineered version of Microsoft source code for trying to make a quote unquote open source version of Windows. Anyways, the data structure looks like this, which I'm going to draw in sort of more our typical format. Uh, hopefully this will all be, you know, accurate in the sense of, you know, sizes and distance. Assume a width of this is eight bytes. So a list, for instance, is two pointers. So that's, you know, two high and eight bytes large. And we've got, you know, this is going to be two bytes, four bytes, two bytes, etc. Right. So short two bytes flags, unknown four bytes, unknown, unknown one word, two bytes. So this is trying to be, you know, an accurate uh, representation of this data structure. And the most relevant fields of this data structure for our exploitation later on are going to be this pnet raw buffer, which is, you know, we saw for the thing coming in, that was where the source data was uh, pulled from. But it's also going to be things like this pmdl. So we'll get there in a second. All right, so if this is what a server net buffer header looks like, 
then after all of this allocation of size in order to allocate and malloc that you know data structure i said you know it's 50 and then it's this much size and then it's padding and then it's one of these well after all of that then how is this used well right down here we have server header uh, p non paged pool address that is set to this p non page pool address that is the value that was allocated here based on all of those calculations so they're basically going to replug that value into the header then we're also going to have things like the srb header p net raw buffer set to uh, p non page pool address plus 50 so okay whatever this allocation was but then 50 bytes into it that's going to be the p net raw buffer so that's initialized to a you know monotuck controlled value just based on this allocation and then also interesting is this srb header p mdl1 and so that's allocated right there and these things point down at this mdl1 so we'll get into that again in a little bit so after all of that, you know, special purpose under allocation that occurred from passing in attacker controlled values, what we're going to see is effectively this. You're going to have the actual thing that's returned. Actually, let me go back for a second. The return here is actually pointing to SRB header. So the pointer that's returned is SRB header. But SRB header is not actually pointing at the beginning of this allocation. SRB header is set to that allocation plus the size, so offset however much, plus 50. So if we go forward, sorry, I gotta walk through the animations again. So the important thing is to know that that is not pointing at the beginning of the allocation. Instead, you know, the allocation was a total of, you know, 50 plus this amount, which was specified right here. And so that could be a too small amount, some padding, and then the SRV net uh, buffer SRV net buffer header right so right there so this thing points at the header the header is some offset into the overall allocation and these things in here point at various locations in the allocation so for instance the p non page pool address that is the actual beginning of this buffer right here and things like the p net raw buffer points at the beginning of that uncompressed data where you know the code assumed that it was going to have uncompressed copied to there and compressed decompressed into there so you know this is not to scale but you can see how if this compressed data decompresses into here it's going to start smashing this server net buffer header and so we said what was smashed well this server net buffer header is going to be smashed and additionally as will be very important later the PMDL points down here. So again, this is that full data structure, but these are gonna be the most important fields. These are, everything's gonna be smashed, but these ones are gonna be profitably smashed to the attacker's benefit. So this is what the state of things looks like after the allocation. Now let's move on to the overflow. So SMB compression decompress takes an attack controlled type. And this right here is going to be the address of the compressed data, right? So the input should be the compressed data that needs to be decompressed. So the pointer points at back in this, you know, original attacker controlled data pulled in from the network, points right there. Then we've got the compressed header offset length that was being pulled from uh, right here, offset or length. So pulled out of the attacker controlled headers in front of the data coming in from the network. So that's going to say, you know, here's the size of this thing that I want you to decompress. Then we have attacker controlled offset into p net raw buffer so this is that new header that was allocated so this new header right here p net raw buffer plus offset or length so you can see p net raw buffer points right here but you're doing a plus offset or length which is exactly the size of the uncompressed data notionally so this is actually going to point right here right the location for decompression that's as you expect source from the compressed data, destination of the decompressed data. It's all good so far. And then the original compressed seg size, this is telling it, you know, how big this is expected to decompress to after the decompression occurs. So we know that this was an under allocation. So let's go ahead and let that over copy smash all the way down into that server net buffer header. So what can the attacker actually do with that? Well, all of a sudden, all of these good pointers from before turn into bad acid pointers pointing anywhere that the attacker wants.
that's not good. That's, you know, a lot of control for the attacker. If all of a sudden they can point at any given arbitrary address and cause, you know, reads or writes to occur from those addresses, that's not good. Okay, so what do they actually do with that? Well, let's say that they, for instance, overwrote this p net raw buffer down here, and it's an acid pointer pointing wherever they want. Right after that SMB decompression, there was that second buffer overflow. There was that mem move, and that mem move sourced from p net raw buffer. So that right there is now fully attacker controlled pointer pointing anywhere they want. Then we've got source data coming from this uncompressed data, which is attacker-controlled data coming in from the network, and a size that is attacker-controlled. So that is all sorts of awesome. That is the capability to write anything you want, anywhere you want. And that is a powerful primitive. <laughs>
So we know the attacker can overflow this pointer to point sort of anywhere. They could also overflow this, but because they don't necessarily know where all of this is in memory, it may be more beneficial for them to point this at somewhere they know they can find one of these, as opposed to this where they might not know the address of this at the time that this was uh, located in memory. So what are they going to do with that? Let's back up for a second. We said that ultimately this overflow one leads to an overcopy. That overcopy is going to smash the PMDL one and they can point that pointer anywhere. And because they don't know exactly where this is allocated in memory, they can't you know, assume that just because they, basically they can't know what the address of that MDL baked into this thing is. So they need to find somewhere else to put an MDL that will ultimately hold uh, page frame addresses for physical memory they want to read. Turns out that just overflowing from top to bottom like that will actually lead to an early death. That will lead to a crash because this overflow of this non-paged pool address is going to lead to a crash eventually. So the attacker has to back up and do a little bit smarter overflow. And instead of pointing down here at this you know, decompressed space, they're going to need to flip this offset a little bit more and ultimately skip their way past this value, which if overwritten will crash them, and to just do the overcopy starting right here. So they still want to smash the MDL, but uh, they want to avoid corrupting this, which would lead to a crash. So, okay, they're back to a safe way to you know, overwrite the MDL, but where do you point it? You've got an acid pointer. Where do you point it? To point at a fake MDL, ideally. And that fake MDL should describe some physical frames, and those physical frames will be read and returned back to the attacker on the network. So again, in summary, PMDL points at an MDL struct to describe some physical memory. Physical memory will be returned to the client in an SMB response. They need to point this PMDL1 at an ACID forged MDL because they can't actually know where the, their original MDL1 was uh, in order to bypass this address-based layout randomization. So they need to reliably introduce a forged pointer to some MDL. Well, this is where we get into you know, the limitations of implementations of address-based layout randomization. Very frequently, it's the case that you know, when address-based lay layout randomization is first introduced, you know, not everything is randomized, and then uh, the defenders randomize some more and randomize some more. You know, it's, it's very hard to introduce this into an existing you know, operating system, RTOS, firmware, and what have you. So any sort of thing where an ASLR implementation does not randomize something, that is almost certainly going to be abused by an attacker. In the context of Windows, we've got a page called K user shared data, the page is hex 1000 bytes. And this is known by attackers to be shared between user space and kernel space. And it's always going to be mapped at a fixed non-randomized location, all Fs 78000. That's going to be the address in uh, kernel space, and then it's going to be at a different address in user space. So basically, an attacker always knows that if they write some data into an address at that location, they can guarantee it's going to be found at that location and they can you know, put pointers pointing to there, for instance. So what is the attacker's goal now? Like, how are they gonna do this? Step one, they're going to forge an MDL in the K user shared data page using the original arbitrary write primitive. So the thing you have to think about here is that an attacker can send multiple packets doing multiple writes to multiple different locations and get everything all uh, set up the way that they want before they ultimately you know, take down the full system with arbitrary code execution. Step one, they're going to write data into the KUser shared data, a fake MDL. Step two, they're going to uh, overwrite that PMDL1 and point it at the forged MDL from step one. And then step three, and this is a little bit of you know, hand wavy, just you know, not shown in the slides, but from the original write-ups, basically by causing decompression to fail on purpose, it will make it so that the MDL that was being used for sort of an input thing and the server net header that was being used for the input will be flipped around and being used as the response instead of you know, the, the input. So let me try to visualize that for you. So going back to the original sort of second buffer overflow, the first buffer overflow went ahead and smashed all of this stuff, right? So if they smash up through pnet raw buffer with the first overflow, then they go to the second overflow 
and that pnet raw buffer can point at the k user shared data area and then they can go ahead and source data from here and within that data can be a fake mdl that specifies some physical frames that ultimately they're going to want to read from and then it's got an attack controlled size so that mem move is just going to take that and write it at a known location in a known address that is never randomized and is always writable from kernel space okay so that is the setup getting a fake mdl there that's our forged mdl with forged addresses of physical frames that the attacker would like to read now step two they're going to you know reset go again send a new packet like that first thing was just the you know first packet with two overflows the first to crash that and the second to write to there now they come back and they send a new packet and in the new packet the first overflow is again going to skip forward and not smash that otherwise it'll crash and just smash the pmdl so over copy that and then what address should they put? Well, this nice hard-coded constant address where they know exactly where they can find this forged MDL. And then step three was this sort of hand wavy thing, error out during decompression on purpose. So that is and requires a little more trickiness to basically provide compressed data that is going to you know, be copied. And then when the decompression starts, it's going to error out because it's gonna say, oh, hey, this data is invalid. So. This initial data is like a request coming from the attacker on the network to the SMB server on the victim machine. So it's originally a request. And then this is also supposed to be a request buffer that just got allocated. The whole point of this request buffer was just to take all of this stuff, you know, copy the uncompressed stuff over to here, and then copy the compressed stuff after decompression into this new buffer, right? So they were just trying to make space for this new buffer. You know, it's like, at this point, they're just like, I was just trying to make space, man. And then, you know, they get very frustrated because you know, this is a, it's a real thumb in the eye seeing all of this go down. The attack just slowly and methodically making their way towards the victim. Anyways, so this was a request buffer that was uh, trying to just make space to copy the data. But if the attacker causes the decompression to fail, then... Instead, what's going to happen is this is going to get flipped around and for you know optimization purposes, it's going to say, oh, well, something went wrong. I need to reply back to the request and tell them something went wrong. And again, just for optimization purposes, they're like, well, I've already got this you know buffer here and it's got all of the fields and the server net header that I want. So yeah, I'm just going to reuse that and reply back to them. But because it doesn't actually get reinitialized fully, then it's still going to be using this for, this uh, clobbered pointer to MDL1, which points at a forged MDL, which points at arbitrary physical addresses that the attacker would like to read from. And then ultimately TCP IP is just going to go ahead and consume this buffer and be like, oh, they wanted, you know, the data from that. Well, I guess I'll send them the data from that. Wanted the data from that. Oh, I guess I'll send them the data from that. And attacker controlled physical memory is going to be read and sent back to the attacker. And with that, the attacker has unlocked another exploit primitive, the arbitrary physical address read primitive. And, you know, that's great, except, you know, are we done? That's not good enough. No, we are not done as an attacker. Because most of the time, all of these sort of operations occurring on an operating system are virtual memory operations. They're not physical memory operations. The operating system has uh, page tables in effect. It has virtual memory. And therefore, normal addresses that you're dealing with are virtual addresses, not physical addresses. As we talk about extensively in the Open Security Training 2 Architecture 2001 OS Internals class, if you need to learn more about this. So at this point, the attacker can read arbitrary physical memory, but what they need is the capability to read arbitrary virtual memory so that they know where they can, you know, find something like a function pointer that they can overwrite so that they can then just, you know, jump to code that they control. So, you know, what are they going to do here? Well, now we got to dig a little bit into page tables. Again, talked about more in Architecture 2001, but this is just super nutshell version because quite honestly, 2001 goes into way too much detail about it. So if you had something like a virtual address of all Fs, the mechanism of page tables, which is handled by the hardware, is going to essentially break up that address into a sequence of bit fields. 
and the most significant 16 bits are not going to be used. And then the next nine bits are going to be used to index into the first page table, the page map level four. So the hardware has some pointer to some physical memory that holds a table that was set up by the operating system at some point. And so whenever it's trying to access some virtual memory address, just automatically the hardware says, okay, point two, first table, take these nine bits, offset into array, okay, pull from that, that finds address of next table, take next nine bits, okay, offset into array. And so it's basically just walking through these page tables and you know, typically it's this four level paging increasing on some newer systems, it gets increased to five level paging. But the whole point is just that this is some table that is used to translate from a virtual address through a sequence of tables to a physical address which is actually RAM where the data can be found. And the hardware goes out and you know, sends a physical address out to RAM and says, dear RAM, you know, give me the data from this address. And so the last 12 bits say, inside of that page, here we're gonna assume it's hex 1000 big. Inside that page, give me you know, byte FFF. So 12 bits, all ones is byte FFF. Please give me the last byte of memory. Of course, that's not actually gonna be a memory that's going to be firmware on Intel systems. That's covered in architecture 4001, but again, we don't need to know that. The concept here and the point here is that the attacker can read arbitrary physical addresses so they could read these raw tables and stuff if they knew where to find them and if they knew where to find them then they could potentially use them to translate physical addresses to virtual addresses now there's another little trick that isn't talked about in architecture 2001 and is being saved for a future windows os internals class and that is the notion of self-referential page tables so you can learn more about that at this citation three which is what uh, the researchers who did the exploit cited. So self-referential page tables is the notion of if you had an address like FFFFF, well, maybe that address could point at a table that points at a table that points at a table that points at a table, and then the last entry of that table could actually point back at the original table. So the physical address, instead of being just, you know, some random RAM, turns out to be the physical address of the actual first table in this lookup chain. So Windows uses that in order to make it easier for them to make modifications to these tables themselves. And then furthermore, because of the way that virtual memory is split up, uh, the least significant uh, half of this table is used for user space mappings, and the most significant half is used for kernel space mappings. So out of a possible 512 entries, the top 256 are always going to be guaranteed to be the ones that are used for kernel virtual memory to physical address mappings. So when it comes to an attacker trying to figure out how to turn their physical memory read primitive into a virtual memory read primitive, what they're gonna to wanna to do is they're gonna to want to find these page tables. They're going to want to find the self-referential entry. Uh, and then once they find that, they can say, okay, I've found the page table, I've found the self-referential entry, and now I can just walk these tables, read this physical address, read that physical address. I can find that physical address from the entry in here read this physical address, I can find that from the entry in here. And so these entries tell them which physical addresses to read to get a complete collection of page tables. And then basically they can say, oh, I would like to read virtual address blah. Then they look up in their page tables, which they have just captured. Okay, well, blah corresponds to physical address foo. And now I can read from physical address foo and I will effectively be reading from virtual address blah. So anyways, Windows used to hard code the self-referential entry on modern systems, it now randomizes it, but there's only 256 options, therefore an attacker can just brute force it and ultimately find themselves a complete collection of page tables from which to directly translate virtual to physical addresses. Oh look, it's an animated searching for the uh, self-referential entry. So then there's the question of how do they find, you know, that first page table in order to go do the walking and, you know, they could brute force and search every single physical address on, you know, someone's system, but doing a search using crazy exploits, one per, you know, few physical frames, that's going to take a really long time. So instead, they analyzed how the Windows bootloader works and they found that when the system boots up, the very first page table, this page map level four, was not actually randomized. And they could guarantee on UEFI systems that that would always be at physical address 1AD000. So using that arbitrary physical address read that they had, they could just read this address. And then from that address, they could go search for, you know, through all of the 256 entries, they could read the next physical address for each of those and eventually find the thing that is self-referential and walk their way through the tables.
And so now at last they have their arbitrary virtual address read primitive. So arbitrary virtual address read primitive, unlocked, success, right? They're done. No, they are not done. They still got to keep chugging. You can see how this is just engineering though, right? Like this is just about what does the attacker know about how the system works? They have to know a lot if they want to succeed. But, you know, we're in the end game now. So getting close. They have arbitrary write and they have arbitrary read. So now it's just a question of what do they write and how do they find it? So they could choose anything at this point. They need to, you know, change the instruction pointer to point at attacker controlled code. A common way that that would be achieved is by overriding something like a function pointer. And then the question is, you know, which function pointer? And this just all comes down to, you know, the particular attacker and what they know about the system, what they're comfortable with, what they've done in the past. These attackers from two decided to do a search through the kernel memory for the hardware abstraction layer heap, which has some known function pointers in it. So once they found these candidate pages that, you know, looked like they might be the hardware abstraction library heap layer, sorry, hardware abstraction layer heap, then they just checked some offsets to see whether they match their expectations. So this, of course, could, you know, change depending on Windows version, so they had to build up a little table. So if you imagine the attacker with their arbitrary physical address read, you know, they can read physical address zero, and then they say, okay, at this offset right here, does it end in 3740 or blah or blah or blah for however many blah versions of Windows they want to support? And here it says, no, nope, it doesn't. So continue on, do their arbitrary physical address read. And does this at this offset end in 3740? Yes, it does. Great. I've found a function pointer on the HAL heap. I'm going to go ahead and remote write to that physical address. And boom, now I've got an ACID function pointer, which will allow me to redirect control flow to my attack controlled values, my attack controlled code. All right, now we are truly in the end game. Attacker controlled function pointer is going to jump to some arbitrary code. Where is the code? What does it do? Well, of course, we've got this shared data that is non-randomized. So they put their forged MDL in there. And right after that, they put their kernel shell code and user space shell code. So function pointer jumps to kernel shell code. What does kernel shell code do? It goes ahead and it modifies NTDLL, which is a dynamic link library that's going to run in user space. And they patch that to get rid of some control flow guard checks. Now, you may recall from the uh, control flow integrity section, I said that control flow guard was Microsoft's sort of best effort software only implementation of uh, control flow integrity. And just the fact that the attacker did have to patch this means that control flow guard was doing something. So without this, you know, they uh, would have been stymied in their exploitation. But of course, you know, the attacker's taken over the kernel so they can scribble all over everything else that they want to. So they just kill this and lacking the, you know, hardware support for uh, control flow integrity that is sufficient. Next, the kernel shell code is going to copy some user space shell code to be run in user space. They're going to use the asynchronous procedure call mechanism that's available to Windows. Then they're going to invoke the shell code. It's going to vector through ntdll.dll, which has been, you know, patched in order to remove the annoying little control flow guard things. And now in a you know, stunning turn of events, shell code was actually used to launch a shell, a command.exe shell. Amazing. Jiggle for happiness. You're done, right? Yes, yes, we are finally done. Can you believe it, right? Well, you know, exploits are complicated, right? If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So all of this because of a little bit of acid math. So ridiculous, right? Right, ridiculous. A couple of buffer overflows due to just, you know, adding two values that were attacker controlled, leading to under allocation, leading to overcopy, not one, but two overcopies in the same area, in the kernel, remotely exploitable via the network, totally wormable because, you know, an attacker could send this exploit into a system and one SMB server could be exploited and start sending out exploits to the next one and so forth. But again, the whole point of this exploitation section is for our developers to understand that, you know, exploitation is an engineering discipline. It is just, you know, another thing that people learn in order to figure out how to do this. And for our vulnerability hunters to know that, you know, this is where you're going after you learn how to find the vulnerabilities, 
you eventually have to learn how to exploit them, and exploiting them in the real world is not like in some dumb little CTF thing. It's not just trivialities, it actually requires skill and engineering knowledge.